1939, Hitler's forces overran unprepared Poland and began World War II. Subsequent invasions of Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Holland, and Belgium also caught the general populace off guard and totally unprepared to fend off foreign invaders. The French resistance and other underground groups courageously did what they could. Their valiant efforts were significantly hampered by the general lack of knowledge regarding improvised weaponry. On the other hand, Hungarian patriots gave the Russian invaders of 1956 a healthy dose of retaliation with little more than wine bottles and gasoline. Many people believe it's possible that a similar invasion scenario could be played out in the United States soon. Movies such as Red Dawn and the made-for-TV series America have concerned themselves with the possible occupation of our country with communist forces. Survivalist author Kurt Saxon is one of these people who believes that a Red Dawn is not only possible, but likely to happen in our generation. You can help wipe the Russians off the face of our uh, country. There'll be, of course, kind of off take over. This program is intended to arm you with the knowledge to create destruction and chaos, large scale and small, swiftly and easily with common materials, in order that you may carry out the appropriate activities should our homeland ever be subjected to occupation by foreign powers. I'm Kurt Saxon, the original poor man's James Bond, so to speak. And I've got lots of reasons to believe that all hell is going to break out, not only in this country, but all over the world, in a couple of years, maybe five. So I would like all of you to become just as self-sufficient and well-armed as possible. Now, just a few months ago, Reagan went to Russia, and they flattered him into saying that the Soviet Union was not such an evil empire after all. But any system which sanctions the use of booby-trapped plastic toys to blow the fingers and hands off Afghan children is truly an evil empire. The Soviet Union is also an economically bankrupt empire with its satellites increasingly determined to shake off Russian influence. The Russians know it's only a matter of time before they must resort to Stalinistic ruthlessness or sidestep their socioeconomic problems with World War III. Gorbachev is a realist who would gamble on war abroad rather than relinquish power at home. His present attempts to relax tensions is simply a time-gaining ploy to build up his own Star Wars system. The Russians have made a great show of destroying a few nuclear weapons. This is enough to pacify our moronic political hacks. Meanwhile, the Russians are preparing to move on Europe, both as a reason for bringing their own satellites back into line and to gain lootable territory. As we all know, the Soviet Union is far superior to the West in men and conventional armaments. It would take only a short time and a few major losses to force the West to retaliate with nuclear weapons. The, the Russians have always been big on civil defense, while Americans have nearly ignored our own programs. Russia boasts of facilities with which they hope to save up to 80% of their population in a full-scale nuclear war. I doubt that capability. But if they only save 50%, that would still leave 150 million Soviets in a wasteland who could not survive without conquest. So, in order to survive, they would pour across the Bering Straits into Alaska, then to Canada, then the lower 48 states. The American survivors of the war would then face thousands of Red Dawns. With the U.S. destroyed as a nation, with no central authority, but with much decentralized productive capacity, America would be an attractive target for international looters. It might be years before we could kill enough of them to discourage any further incursions. 
This tape was made to illustrate the ease with which anyone can clear his territory of invaders or other undesirables. It shows how to work with ammonium nitrogen triiodide, the fantastically fun fulminate you can make with iodine crystals sold by Atlan formularies, plus how to make ricin, anti-personnel firebombs, and many others. So just hang on and stay in with me. Ammonium nitrogen triiodide is an easy-to-make fulminate obtained from the combination of liquid ammonia and iodine crystals. This is a recipe taken from an article in The Poor Man's James Bond, Volume 1, page 99. For this experiment, you will need the following. Strong ammonia, iodine crystals, paper filters, blotter paper, spatula or putty knife, funnel, and several small containers. Now I'd like to show you how to make ammonium nitrogen triiodide, which I call anti. It's probably the most simple fulminate known, but it's also the most delicate fulminate known. A, a breath of air will uh, explode it, a feather, even the sun, and it can lend itself to so many fantastic projects as your imagination can grasp. Now for the gas tank bomb. Now the gas tank bomb is the most sensational thing you can think of. Now, this little desiccant canister with a bit of uh, ammonium nitrogen triiodide in it will destroy any motor vehicle that has a gas tank, and it would be the best way to put the, the whole Russian army uh, out of commission as far as their transport was concerned. I mean, they, three or four of their vehicles blow up like this, and they'd be walking from then on. They're very paranoid people. I hope you realize that. Now, to make this gas tank bomb, you needed a desiccant canister and some ammonium nitrogen triiodide. And the principle is that uh, once you've made it gasoline proof, then uh, you put it in the gas tank and within maybe a half hour, it will dry enough to uh, go off. And if you know anything about the internal combustion engine, you know how it works. At any rate, uh, it's very simple. You uh, spurt a little gasoline into the cylinder, and uh, the it ignites and keeps the pistons going up and down. Well, just imagine uh, what one of the uh, small explosion would do in a gas tank that had a oh several cubic feet of uh, fumes in there. Uh, especially, it's, it's especially good if the gas tank is only half full, but you, you, they seldom get it more than uh, three quarters full anyway. So there's plenty of room for fumes there. But uh, you've got to make your desiccant canister gasoline proof because the gasoline would just uh, go in there and neutralize the ammonium nitrogen triiodide. So what you need to make these desiccant canisters gasoline proof is simple Elmer's epoxy and hardener. Now that's very easy to, to do. In fact, uh, a guy I know has a lot of fun. He'll take this and he'll mix it up and then he'll go around uh, like certain banks and places he doesn't like before it sets and he can mix it on the spot and he'll just take and he will put some of this in their locks. So when the guy goes to, to open the door, he can't do it. And that causes consternation. But I don't think that that's uh, anything to bother with. Uh, there's all kinds of good stuff you can use with epoxy. I just want you to know, just threw that in. That's a freebie. But uh, one part is the regular stuff, and the other part is the hardener. And you just squeeze some in there and put the caps on nicely. Then you take a regular razor knife and mix it up nice. Now this epoxy will harden in an hour and it'd be completely dry in uh, or overnight. So this is all there is to it. You just do the, the top and the cap. Now, when you got these holes stopped up good and it's dry, then the, the gas will not penetrate this uh, desiccant canister. Now, after that, what you want to do is take care of the iodine crystals. And what you have to do with them is to grind them. Very fine powder. 
Uh, you see, these are crystals, and so they need to be ground, and you don't need more than that. Now, that is a whole bunch. Now, you can take a pair of pliers or anything, but I just happen to be a mad scientist, so I've already got my crucible and my uh, pestle here. And then you just fiddle around. Actually, it's fun when you get into it, especially if nobody's around. And it doesn't take much to make it into a powder. See, now that is just about as powdered as you need to get it. Now we take a little bottle any little bottle with a nice tight cap will do. Sometimes they're too tight. Ah, now, got it open. Now what you do is you take your powder, maybe loosen it up. And you pour it in there. Oh, that's plenty in there. It's like on a cooking show. Show They don't always clean up and things, so I don't either. And then you take some strong ammonia, which you've made with your still, or if you uh, can find a drugstore that sells it, a pharmacy, uh, they will often sell strong ammonia in, for about seven fifty a gallon by uh, hospitals, because the hospitals use it. So you take and you fill your bottle... Don't worry about the ammonia, except to just about kill you if you breathe it in. Oh, but it's fun. I love it. And then you put the cap on there because ammonia is a gas. So you, you've got that, that there like that, and you just let this set for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40. It doesn't really matter, but it needs about uh, 20 minutes or more to uh, convert the, um, the uh, iodine crystals to ammonium nitrogen triiodide. Now, when you've got it set for quite a while, then what you do is you pour it out, because all you want is the... Now, when you, when you get the, to the part where you've got a lot of uh, liquid, uh, now you've got it out, good. Now, then the next step is to pour it on a piece of carbon paper, or no, of blotting paper. And you ought to have a piece of uh, cardboard under it because it will soak in and color your table purple. Now, you see, you got it like that. Now, this is what you want, see? And you smooth it out on the carbon paper, or, I mean the uh, blotting paper, and you can get blotting paper from any office supply store. Now, the uh, reason for that is because you want to get the liquid out of it very quickly. And it happens almost instantaneously. Then, what you do, you don't take a whole lot of it, but you take your desiccant canister like this, and you take about like that, make it so it's flaky and so that it moves around. Because if it sticks to the side, then it's, it's too, it, it won't happen. It's just not going to go off. And you see this has, uh, now this is gas proof. And you see it moves inside there. You don't want it to stick. And you just put the uh, top on it. Now, of course, you would want to do this, what you're doing on the scene. So you'd want to have it made up, and I'm sure you can figure out ways to make it handy. Just make sure there's no Russians watching. And you can make up a half a dozen if you like, as much as you have room for, depending on, well, if you're in a Russians uh, transport center, you might have a couple of tanks and a half track and a the general's car to work on, so you want to make sure you got plenty. And of course, you don't want to put in too much because it has to be so that uh, it has enough space in there for any moisture to dissipate. So after about a half hour, this is all ready to go. And the thing is, 
when the, the vehicle is being driven, that gas is just sloshing like crazy, and this stuff is going to be bouncing all over the place and hitting the sides and the top of the uh, gas tank. And so once it's uh, dry enough, then that Russian is history. Now I'll show you how I mixed up too much of the ammonium nitrogen triiodide uh, for the David Letterman show. So first of all, I will put it on this board, and I'll just put that much. Now on the David Letterman show, I had it about like this. And that was just much too much, as you'll see. Now let me set this aside to dry. Now I'm going to see if I can't set off the ante. Yes. Now, that explosion you saw just then wasn't nearly as great as that on the David Letterman show, but I just didn't want to repeat the whole thing again. Now, I will show you how I meant to have it on with just bits and pieces of it. See there? Now, I'll just reach out with this feather and see if I can't start that off. Whoops! It all went at the same time. So you really can't predict this stuff. Once you've used it and played around with it uh, for a while, then you will uh, know how, how it works, but it's the kind of thing that you want to let it work under a Russian. Now, over here are these uh, gas tank bombs. And now, let me drop it on the table, see if it'll go off. Now, I'll, drop, I'll, I'll take another one and drop it. Now, actually, in most cases, you could make this uh, stuff up right on the scene, but if you've just got to get in and get out, the best thing to do is to prepare your crystals and fold them over with uh, a piece of blotting paper, which is very damp, because you don't want it to go off in your pocket. It would be noisy, but it wouldn't hurt you, but it wouldn't uh, accomplish the purpose. Here's a super idea for constructing a high-efficiency condenser to be used when distilling ammonia or other liquids. The original project is covered in The Poor Man's James Bond, Volume 1, page 101. To construct the condenser, you will need the following. Five or six feet of plastic tubing, approximately three-eighths inch diameter. Two large coffee cans of the three-pound size. A drill motor with necessary bits and silicone caulking. Now I want to show you the condenser that I invented, which is very simple and extremely efficient. I think it's the best thing going. And you can make it in just a few minutes, actually, and for a couple of dollars. Now what it involves is a slab from a three-ounce, uh, three-pound coffee can, bent flat, and a hole drilled near the top and near the bottom, and then it gets folded over and you put in here and then wind it around and around until it, it gets down to the bottom and then put it in there. And of course here you've got your cork to put in the, the uh, can and it has to be nice and uh, with rubber glue so that uh, there's no leak in there. And then when you're done with it, just blow through it. Fine. Now, if the air goes through it nice, then that, sh that means that it's going to work very well. Otherwise, if you've got any crimps in it, or if it's too long, which about six feet is fine, and uh, a lot more is probably causes too much pressure. So if you've got it like this, it's going to work, and you can just use it on and on from then on. Now I'm going to show you how the still is assembled and how it works and how to distill household ammonia to strong ammonia, which you're going to need. 
Now, first of all, you have your regular hot plate, and I've got it turned to low because you don't want the ammonia to boil furiously, which would cause a lot of bubbling and go up and uh, clog the condenser tube. Also, you want to make sure that you only use about a half of that uh, ammonia because if you use much more, then it will still bubble up there. That's what you've got to guard against. Now, the condenser tube leads from the can down into this three-pound coffee can, and it's wrapped around and around and around, but for only about six feet. Now, you've got to watch out for that. When you finish making your condenser, blow through the tube to make sure you have a, a very steady and easy passage, because if your tubing is cramped or if it's too long, then it's going to need more pressure to get the, the vapor here where it will be condensed to liquid and go down into the ammonia jar. So always make sure you do that. Now, when you make your uh, condenser and you seal it at the bottom, then fill it full of water to make sure it doesn't leak. And even if it doesn't leak, a precautionary measure is to put the condenser can into a, a pan of some sort when you put it in your uh, freezer compartment because while it freezes, it may cause pressure which will uh, break that seal or at least cause a little leak and then you'd have the water down into your uh, refrigerator and it could uh, cause you to get a repairman in there. But once you've uh, got it frozen the way I do, then you know that it's, it's free of seals and it would be safe to put it in there without the pan from then on. Ricin is a deadly poison which is obtained from ordinary castor beans and which causes symptoms of natural death. This is a project taken from an article in The Poor Man's James Bond, Volume 3, page 26. For this experiment, you will need the following. Castor beans, large soup cans, household lye, paper towels, acetone, glass jars with lids, water, paper filters, sieve, funnel, plastic cups, screen, newspaper, hypodermic syringe, and dust mask, gas mask, or respirator. Now I'd like to tell you about ricin. Ricin is one of the most toxic organic substances known. One two thousandth of a grain is lethal. And just about all the material you might find on ricin and its extraction is in the Poor Man's James Bond, Volume 3. And that starts about page 23 and goes quite through and it gives a very good coverage. Now, ricin is simply an albumin extracted from castor beans. I will show you what castor beans look like. See, they look like big bloated ticks. And your first step is to get this hull off of the castor beans. And to do that, you add some water to the cup where it covers them nicely. And then you have a spoon, you get some regular lye from the department, from, from the, your uh, cleaning department of any supermarket. And you put in a good teaspoonful and you stir it up for a minute. And then you've got to put something over it to cover them because they float and you want them down in there, but that's self-explanatory. Anyway, after they've been in that an hour or two, then they're a little larger and you have to take the hulls off. And that's very easy because the hulls have been expanded. You just take like that and take your pliers, give a nice crunch, and then it doesn't take but a couple of seconds to take the whole thing off. See there, it's as simple as that. Now you got your bean, and this is what a, a bunch of them look like, hulled. Now the next thing after you've got them hulled is, I'll get that out of the way. You've got to mash them. Now there are two ways. One is uh, to take, one way to take the oil out is to put the beans 
in some folds of newspaper and take a hammer and pound it good. You do that on the floor. And that will really pound the beans and take some of the oil out of it right then. But uh, also, there's another step to it. You take and you pick up those castor beans mashed up. And that's not hard. And then to press them more, you take some paper towels. Now, the, the paper towel type press is done very simply. You fold it once, again, again, one more time, and then put it at the bottom of a tin can. Now, you've got like that there. Okay, now the next thing you do is you take your uh, paper towel and you dump all this stuff on the paper towel. Get rid of that. It's okay to touch it. It's not going to hurt you. It's only when it's been, well, when you're dealing with the pure ricin that you want to make sure you don't breathe any of it. Now, this might be a little mushy for you at first, but uh, that doesn't really matter. Okay, you fold it over, you fold it over again, and then just wrap it up like that. Then you go like this, and like that, and like that, back and forth on itself. And you sort of ball it up, put like this, nice and well centered. Make another folded towel. Put that on top of that. And then you take several can lids and you put it in, force them all the way down. Now the idea is to press the oil out of these beans. Now with the paper, and especially if you leave it in the paper overnight, it'll take a lot of oil out, but you want even more than that. So what you do is you take this and you put it under a bed leg, as, as illustrated here, See, here's the can, here's the, t the lids, the bounty pad, the uh, towel with the beam of the bounty pad, and you put the bed leg in here right in the middle and force it down so you've got a natural press. So after you get up the next day, here's what it looks like when it's pressed. Just shake it out. Whoops. Bear with me here. Now here you got them in there, you just dig them all out. Throw the pads aside there, got most of the grease in them. Then you unroll your bounty towel, like so. It is just full of oil. You couldn't hardly do better at a machine shop and pressing and now we're coming close to the really nearly oilless castor bean pulp okay so once you've got it off if it tears the paper that's okay uh, that the, the paper doesn't mean anything you can put some of the paper into the solution now we just get this out of the way. And the next thing, you take the uh, castor bean pulp and whatever paper is on it and uh, put it in a mason jar or whatever jar you want. Like that. And don't worry about the paper because that'll, that won't be part of it. And uh, then you take seven ounces of water, pour it in there, like so. Three quarters of an ounce of table salt and blend it for from three to five minutes and then pour it in a jar and let it set for about 48 hours. Now what that does, it separates the albumin, which has the ricin in it, from the bean pulp. And so in this way you throw away the uh, bean pulp once you've got the albumin out of it. And so you just take another jar. This is a good one to do it because it's just, oops, 
That's not the right one either. See, I'm not being too formal here. Just showing you how the stuff works. And as you work it out, you'll, you'll make mistakes, as I do and as everybody else does, especially ki kitchen chemists and mad scientists, because we make the most mistakes of all, because we're just in it for the fun of it. So what we do is we slosh this around to get it nicely broken up. Now, this is the liquid kind. Now, this takes longer because there's so much uh, fluid in there, and it sticks to the filter. But anyway, just, just let it go like that. Now, when you've got uh, this, when, when you've got all the liquid out, you just throw the pulp away, and the liquid is fantastic for using in a hypodermic needle. You take and you give a quick shove into somebody's rump, and... Uh, Especially if it's like on a crowded street, you just go up to, in back of some Russian soldiers, you, you just give them a quick stab and then uh, fade into the crowd, and uh, he'll just uh, rub his behind for a little bit, and then he will uh, die in about three days of pneumonia. A lot of my customers wanted to know how to get all the oil out, and they wanted the acetone process. Now, you can buy acetone at any paint or hardware store for about $2 a quart. And you put your ounce of uh, pulverized castor beans in a jar, and then you pour in the uh, pour in about four ounces of uh, acetone, and you shake it up nice, and you uh, leave it for about three days. You can shake it whenever you want, but that doesn't have too much to do with it. And that will take out plenty enough uh, castor uh, bean ingredient to go on to your next step. Now, even so, I would say that the powder, I would uh, suggest, would be that the powder would meet all anyone's needs. I think that uh, the, what happened to the legionnaires was that the person had very fine powder without going all the way to get the pure ricin, and he put the powder in the uh, air conditioning system, and that went all over the room in very small bits because it just takes a fleck of the powder holding a little bit of the uh, ricin in it to kill because it's, it's like a catalyst. It's like, for instance, if you can imagine a whole warehouse full of gunpowder and you take a tiny spark and that sets off the gunpowder, well, a tiny fleck of this uh, ricin in the nose or intravenously from a needle is uh, we'll just start a chain reaction among the cells that it acts on and uh, the person will die of pneumonia in about three days. But anyway, if you'll uh, notice here, see that very fine white powder in the bottom there? Now that is af after it's been counted to 200, of course you could count to three or 400 and get even more powder, but you've got a whole lot of lethal stuff here. And then what you do is you filter this, shake it up good, and filter it in another of these things. And then I'll tell you how to use, how to get the, the very fine powder. Try not to let it run over. And if there's any sludge in there, don't bother with it. Well, there is some sludge, but it has happens to be very fine powder sludge, but that's fine. This is all you'll need. Now you're all set up. Now when this, and, and see how quick that's coming out of there, this at the bottom is just acetone, and when we're done with that, we just throw it away. Uh, preferably someplace outside or in the garbage where no one can get at it, no pets or anything. And uh, so then you'll have a, a, an ounce of probably the most lethal organic substance there is and a little bit will go a long way. And now getting back to this, the liquid stuff, what is uh, the best delivery system for it would be through a hypodermic needle or say a water pistol. Now, I got a, a this is a little squirt water pistol. And what you do is you take a baggie and you wrap it around it. 
because you don't want to get any of this on your hands. And uh, a, another innovation is to mix half of this liquid and half DMSO. Now, DMSO has the property that it takes anything through the skin extremely fast. It will take any kind of poison. They, they use it uh, for arthritis, and of course they use uh, old pain medications, and they'll put it in the DMSO, and that will drive it through the uh, skin. And say, for instance, that you should load your little squirt with uh, half uh, of this water and half DMSO, and you just act like you're clowning around before your opponent, maybe like a Russian guard, and then just squirt him like that, and uh, he'll probably knock you down, but then you go on, see, and in about three days, he's dead. And so that, that, that'd pay you for knocking him down. And of course, this uh, little squirt holds maybe about a hundred little squirts, and you could uh, just pass among a mob of Russians and have a high old time, and you probably wouldn't even go to jail. Now, we've got this just about as far as it needs to go here, and so I will add the uh, Epsom salt solution, but first I'm going to put on a glove because any of this moisture that gets on your hands that is extremely poisonous so we don't want to get that on the hands at least not on your hands now i'm lifting that out i'm going to set this aside because this is contaminated and now the next thing i'm going to do is pour in this three ounces of uh, water with one teaspoonful of Epsom salts. And if the book tells it like it is, then this Epsom salt should coagulate the ricin in there, which is uh, at the beginning at, like uh, it's an albumin, like egg white. So if we do it right, then uh, you should see little flecks going down through there. But even if you shouldn't, now I've seen it before. But now I've got a camera on me, and every time I have a camera on me, something goes a screwy. But uh, in a few minutes, that should start uh, uh, coming out there, and you can see the little white flakes. But we're not going to wait a few minutes. When it starts, I'll bring it back before the camera. Now, I can see it coagulating only very faintly. It's too faint for the camera, but already a lot of the albumin has solidified into pure ricin on the bottom, if you can pick up that. Okay. okay. But again, I would uh, say don't even bother with that part because when you wind, when you finish it, all you got is a little bit of ricin like this. And of course, that's fantastically potent. But uh, I think you should just take it to the part where you've got the liquid and then uh, use the liquid in a syringe or water pistol or whatever it is. Or, better still, use the powder itself. And now, to get the best powder, you've got to use the acetone. Like I said, uh, four ounces of acetone to one ounce of uh, castor bean pulp. And uh, then you put it in a filter and in one of these filter holders I invented. And then, now the, water, the liquid has gone out of that. And you've got a cone of... Uh, the mush, and it still has some acetone in it, but acetone dries very quickly. So what we're going to do, you see this powder here? Aha, that's beautiful stuff. That'll knock off hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Russians, all you could probably meet that day. And if you put it in the air conditioner of any kind of uh, squad room they're using, uh, or if, if they got air conditioned quarters, now being Russians, they probably don't know what an air conditioner is, but they'd learn from us. And so you just, better if you teach them how to use it so you can put this stuff in the air conditioning system. And then you take a, a spatula and you mash it up, spread it around good, because we want to get it to, to the point where it's a very fine powder. Right now it's not at all dangerous because it's uh, soaked with acetone. But when we start turning this into a really fine powder, then uh, you'll want to wear the face mask. Now, also, this was run through uh, four ounces of uh, acetone, and then uh, 
I did what I'm doing now, and now I'm doing it again. I put in, I, I threw away the acetone, and I put in four more a ounces of acetone, so that we could get it, so that it's uh, it take even more of the oil in it, be, out of it, because you can't uh, use it as long as it has any oil in it. So you you run the process twice to take more oil out of it. Now we got this pretty well dried. And so the next step is to take and run it through this screen and see how much good tiny powder we get. You just dump it in there. Now you need the face mask on at this point because you don't want to snuff up any of the powder up your nose because that would be really bad after a while. And we just take these, this stuff with the residue and put it in the trash. Then take the spatula and help some of it go through. That's going through nice. Now, if you can get a close up on this, you'll find as fine a powder as you can want. Now, this was only done with two soakings in acetone and uh, two pulverizations in the blender. Of course, you could run it, you could do the thing three times and you'd get even more and finer. Now, if you can make a close up of this powder, let me set this aside. Now, you really have some lethal stuff here. It's just as flaky as anyone would want it. And as I said, I think it's the, it was the powder from the beans themselves without any salt solution or anything else that was uh, put in the air conditioner at the hotel and got all of those legionnaires. Now that is fantastic stuff. It's as fluffy as you'd want it and you could, it would, it's also fluffy enough to put in a hypodermic needle with some, to put it back in some liquid. So that's the end of that process. Improvised weaponry achieved new heights when this easy to conceal, guaranteed to detonate cocktail was devised. If you like, you may refer to the poor man's James Bond, volume one, page 103. For this experiment, you will need the following. Gasoline, used light bulbs, needle nose pliers, small funnel, Kleenex or soft cloth, standard soup cans, styrofoam cups, and number six corks. Now for your anti-personnel firebomb, you take a light bulb, and what you've got to do is take the contact point off with a pair of needle nose pliers, and that's not at all hard. Just a few little pinches here, and off that comes. Part of the dried tar is out with it already. Actually, you can do these about a one a minute when you get the hang of it. Then you take the pliers, and you see that part there. You got to knock that out. Now it's ready to fill. Simple as that. And you have a perfect fire bomb. And I bet General Electric didn't know their light bulbs were recyclable. Now, of course, I've shown you how to take the insides out of the bulb. And so when you've got the insides out of the bulb, then you take four ounces of gasoline. Now, no more. And you make it so you can pour it in there. We don't know. Let's not. That's, that gets a little messy. So we'll use, just use a funnel. Now, you see, that's your load there, four ounces. Now, you notice the space there. You don't want to fill it up completely because if you fill it up completely and it hits in a way that the, the liquid will... Uh, well, the, the liquid will probably just put out the fire before the fumes could uh, get lit. So you've got to have some fumes there, and it only takes a couple of seconds. And then you take a piece of Kleenex or toilet tissue, 
and uh, about four ply or whatever. You can test it out for yourself. And then, of course, you go like that, and you've got it all ready to go. Now, I'm not going to light this in my basement. Now, you've seen the, you, you'll see the uh, demonstration elsewhere, but this is all it takes. Now, of course, if you, if you feel the need to uh, make them up and take them someplace, like toward the Russians' headquarters, and what you'll want is a number six cork, see? And then, of course, you want to carry it in a Campbell's soup can. Now, this is cream of mushroom, but you can use tomato soup. It doesn't matter what the can had in it. And then, of course, the, you cut off the bottom of a styrofoam cup and put it in there, and you've got it like that, see? And so you can have it in your pocket, and nothing can happen to it. And then when you get to the scene, then you just stick this sucker in there, and she's ready to go. So I think that's beautiful. It's almost like a spiritual experience to make these. Now, tip the bottle over a, bit, a little bit, get a little gasoline on it, and then you light it. Hold it just a minute to make sure that it's nicely lit, and then throw it. Now, you may have noticed that I'm shy a few fingers. Uh, you might be next if you're careless with explosives like I was. One day I, was, I had less than a half ounce of potassium chlorate, and it was dry, and the recipe called it for, for it to be wet, but I didn't see any reason for that because I wanted it dry. And so I mixed just a smidgen of red phosphorus, and my fingers went all over the kitchen. I tell you, that was the most exciting thing that happened to me all that day. But it taught me a lesson. Simple to make, Saxon Savage is a cheap and effective improvised weapon for close quarters. Now, this item I call the Saxon Savage. I invented it. That's what I do. Now, it consists of three number 16 nails pushed into a 4-inch long and 5-8-inch uh, wide dowel. Now, to make it, all you've got to do is get that type of dowel, find a drill just slightly smaller than the nail, put three holes in it, and then pound them through. Now, if you don't drill first, it's simply going to split the dowel. Now, you might also take the nail and grind the tips to a very sharp point. And I always paint it for effect. And I'll give you an idea of what it does. It's a really heck of a weapon. Now, this can do a lot of damage. But to keep it from doing damage to you or your clothes, I suggest you cut a four-inch length of cardboard corrugated box, put the tines in there, and you can carry it safely in your pocket or however you want to carry it. And then, of course, when you want to use it, you just flick that off, and it's ready. And it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, anyone who might be attacked, this is a really fearsome weapon at under a cost of $1, and anyone can make it. Straight from the Frankenstein movies, Jacob's Ladder is a project which would be fun to do with the kids. It also has obvious possibilities for use with improvised weapons. Now, I'd like to show you the uh, Jacob's Ladder or Horn Gap, and it's a very nice effect usually used in Frankenstein-type movies. And it's not very practical, but it is in page two, 302 of this uh, Poor Man's James Bond, and I've gotten several requests for information on it. So what it is, it's a, simply a neon sign transformer, and it's hooked up to two electric fence insulators and around here we have number eight copper wire that's wrapped around there once and of course you can see it goes up there and sometimes it goes all the way and sometimes it doesn't 
But it's sort of interesting, but as I said, it's not too practical. But uh, here's one of the things it does. Now, you can probably imagine all sorts of things that you would like to do with it. There are several books on terrorism out, and uh, it seems like they all want a great wave of terrorism. But just to give you an example, <clears throat> here's Neil Livingstone's The War Against Terrorism. Of course, it's a misnomer because there is no war against terrorism. Uh, he takes me to task and several others who put out so-called mayhem manuals and gives us a whole chapter and tells about how dangerous we are to society. And yet, with all of Paladin's books and Lupanic's books and my books, there hasn't been one terrorist act committed as a result of the knowledge in those books. They go to guns and firebombs and things that anybody knows but they don't use improvised weaponry. At least they haven't up till now, and they probably won't ever. And then at one place, he's almost disappointed. And he says, what is surprising is what they have not done in view of the extraordinary range of new weapons and targets available to them. It's like saying, hey guys, that's dumb. Uh, you're not doing it right. If you really want to bring society to its knees, here's how, and he goes on page after page of horrendous mass antisocial acts that would bring society to its knees. Here, Kurt lights his cigarette with an ice cube. This parlor trick is covered in Granddad's wonderful book of chemistry, page 156. One trick for the David Letterman show was how to light a cigarette with an ice cube. Now, to do that, I need a sliver of metallic potassium or sodium, but I've got potassium right here, and potassium is a little more volatile. Now you see the shiny side, if it gets oxidized, forms that white stuff on it, then it won't work very well. But the way to do it is to put a sliver of it in the end of a very dry cigarette. It's like that. Then here it works after a fashion. But what I neglected to do on the David Letterman show was to make sure that the cigarettes had been dried in an oven because the moisture caused the sliver of potassium to oxidize so it, the water didn't penetrate and it just sputtered and made a very dumb looking trick. Now, next I tried to light a fire with water and the trick to that was to have some ether in a pan with the bit of sodium or potassium metal and uh, when I poured the water in it, it was supposed to get to the uh, metallic sodium or potassium and light it and of course it in turn would light the ether. But what happened was that most of the ether had gone away and the metallic sodium had oxidized so it wouldn't light. And it just sputtered like that. And so that was, well, there you go. Got the camera on it? Yeah. The economic situation has gotten to the point where in four, four years ago, America was the largest creditor nation and now it's the largest debtor nation. We owe more uh, to other countries than any other country in the world. And finally, when the Japanese economy can't carry that burden, the Japanese stock market will fall flat. And then, of course, the American stock market will go down again, never to go up. And it'll be like a house of cards all over the world, and even Russia and China. And then the whole world will be bankrupt. There won't be any more commerce to keep the balloon getting bigger and bigger. Uh, all of the money will be concentrated in fewer and fewer hands of mainly people who are acquisitors. All they can see is uh, a bigger figure in their bank books.
but uh, to set up a new kind of civilization based on the independence of the individual and eco ecologically sound, economically sound, and uh, governmentally sound, you're going to have a, have a very strong, independent, well-educated people. And every child born will have to be well-born, well-reared, well-educated, and well-occupied. And then we can have what would amount to a heaven on earth. But instead of working for that, people have been working for a hell on earth, and they've got it because they don't respect the planet. They believe most of their religions teach them that this planet is a kind of hell, and what they've got to do is disregard the planet and work for a heaven. Well, I don't know about any heaven, but I do know that this planet is probably the nicest planet in a thousand universes. And we've got to look at the planet as it is, and when this great culling is over, We've got to set about cleaning it up and making certain that what's destroyed our environment and most of our population can never happen again. And mainly what will have to happen is that the individuals will have to become more self-sufficient, less big government, less wealth all tied up in individual hands, uh, not any sort of communism or socialism, probably not any kind of government or economic system we would recognize today, but a governmental system and an economic system which places the value on the individual. So many things have higher priorities than the safety of the public that the public is no longer safe, especially in the urban areas, and so the people in the urban areas for one thing, they should move, but if for some reason they can't move, they had better damn well arm themselves. The term survivalist simply means a person who anticipates the collapse of this civilization and prepares to survive it. It has no connotations of race, religion, politics, or anything else. Anyone could be a survivalist. You just leave uh, the crowded city, move to a small town, and become part of the community, take a trade with you, hopefully, and just be a good citizen from then on, and you're a survivalist without any needing the label at all. I've got to do is write to me, P.O. Box 327, Harrison, Arkansas, 72601, and I will send them a free copy of the current issue of the, the periodical, The Survivor, and it has all sorts of uh, how-tos in it, and it also has a full and complete listings of my books. And uh, now, I'm known mainly for the poor man's James Bond, but that's a hobby of mine. Uh, what I'm really interested in is the survivors themselves. I've got two volumes out so far, and uh, volume three is ready for the printers, and it should be ready by the time uh, you see this tape. So study the book, study the tape, and study your own attitudes and your own skill. Take stock of everything, because what we're messing with is more than dynamite. It could be your life. <laughs>